Hi, folks. Welcome. Uh, we're going to give people a few minutes to join us. But in the meantime, um, let us know who you are and where you're coming from. Um, in the chat box, uh, type in your name, your pronouns, and what brought you here. And of course, we will be answering audience questions uh, later in the hour. So if you have any questions, um, drop them in there as well, and we will prep them for our panelists. I see a couple of familiar names in the audience. Uh, welcome to the Changelers folks in the room. And uh, we also have um, families from two other amazing organizations. So welcome to all the Uncommon Law folks in the room and all the Ella Baker uh, folks in the room. And if you're from none of those organizations, still welcome. We're happy to have you here. All right, we're just gonna give folks about a minute more to join us and then we'll get started. Welcome, Alex, joining us from San Diego. Talia, uh, welcome. Oh, your African American history of course recommended you here. Well, that's that's good. We're having we're having uh, wide reach. Uh, welcome, Lauren, uh, based uh, here in Oakland. Welcome, Christian, all the way from Brooklyn. Hi, hi, Brittany, uh, joining us from San Luis Obispo. All right, folks, keep introducing yourselves, drop your name, drop your pronouns, and where you're coming from. And if you have any questions for our panelists, keep chatting and building community together in the comments. But we're gonna go ahead and get started. So hello and welcome to Dismantling Mass Incarceration. Uh, this is the first in a three-part special event series that is a collaboration between my organization, Change Lawyers, and Uncommon Law. Um, my name is Carlos, by the way. Um, I use he and they pronouns, and I am the chief content director at Change Lawyers. Some of you know me, but some of you uh, don't. And for those of you who don't, uh, Change Lawyers is a legal foundation, and we fund the next generation of lawyers and activists. Um, now, before we dive in and begin, and I introduce uh, Keith and Sack, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge the pain and the heartbreak that is in the room today and across our country. I wanna take a moment to acknowledge the life of uh, Dwayne Wright, who was murdered by police in Minneapolis, and Adam Toledo, a 13-year-old boy who was murdered by police in Chicago. Um, it is, uh, for me anyways, in moments like this, that I am reminded of uh, I heard something I heard Sack uh, Norris say um, at an event a while ago. Um, if you ask someone to just imagine what comes to mind when you hear the term public safety, oftentimes people think punishment, they think prisons, they think handcuffs. But we know that what really makes us safe is being in relationship with each other. Um, and so despite the heartbreak and the pain, um, I today am grateful to be in this room with you all for the next hour. I'm grateful that we get to create the space together um, that we get to uh, talk and show up for each other, and ultimately that we get to uh, build power together. So um, with that, I do want to set a tone for the room. Um, we're about to embark on a conversation that is um, deeply emotional, and um, we invite you all to bring your emotions to the table. You'll see Zach and Keith uh, demonstrate that themselves. And you're about to enter a space where your identities are valuable. Um, and we will be centering the identities and experiences of Black, Indigenous, and people of color. So just keep that in mind. If you are not Black, Indigenous, or a person of color, uh, just be mindful of how much space you take up in the room and in the comments section. Um, so with that, we will have uh, a few minutes of Q&A at the end. So once again, drop your questions into the comments. Um, and at this moment, I would like to introduce you all to uh, our panelists today. Um, they're two uh, um, really like heroes in the social justice lawyering space, particularly here in the Bay Area. I wanna start off with Keith. Um, Keith is the founder 
and the executive director of Uncommon Law. Uh, he has been advocating for the rights of people in prison and on parole for more than 20 years. And uh, Uncommon Law and Change Lawyers have a really special partnership. We so value everything that they do and sort of um, want to see more uh, lawyers, particularly lawyers who come from these communities, um, work at places like Uncommon Law. Um, and in 2018, Keith was selected as one of the Obama Foundation inaugural fellows, which is um, really amazing. And he has also been recognized as a James Irvine Foundation Leadership Awardee. So welcome, Keith. Um, and I also want to introduce uh, Zach Norris. Now, a lot of you know Zach and his organization, Ella Baker Center for Human Rights. Um, and some of you might have read his book, Defund Fear. Um, I highly, highly encourage it. I change lawyers, it's sort of um, uh, mandatory reading. <laughs> uh, and Zach is also the co-founder of Restore Oakland, a community advocacy and training center uh, here in the Bay Area. Um, Zach helped build California's first statewide network of families of incarcerated youth, which led to the closing <laughs> five youth prisons in California. Um, so welcome, Zach, as well. Thank you, Carla. And you all take it away. I'm out of here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Carlos. Really appreciate that. And thanks to, to Annie on my team, who's helped uh, put this event together and get us all in this space. Um, Zach, it's always a pleasure to to uh, be in your presence. You're, you're definitely my, one, one of my heroes. and and all the efforts that we try to do to impact our community. Likewise, likewise. Um, and, and, you know, I want to provide a little bit of background um, and, and set the stage for not just this uh, talk we're having today, but this this whole series that we've, we've put together. Um, at Uncommon Law, we provide what we refer to as trauma-informed counseling and legal assistance to people who are serving life sentences. Uh, and here in California, we have some 35,000 people serving those sentences. Uh, it's far more than any other state. Uh, and we have a, a discretionary parole process through which parole commissioners uh, conduct hearings with each parole applicant to determine whether they can safely be released. In our work at Uncommon Law, we spend a lot of hours um, helping our clients understand and, and articulate the ways in which their own trauma histories contributed to their actions in harming others. You know, we've, we are really proud that we've now seen uh, 269 of our clients released from their life sentences. Uh, and, and we're just as proud that only 1% have ever been returned to prison for any reason. Uh, but, but we're always quick to make two things clear, even with that. First is that um, all of those folks got themselves out of prison. You know, I've never gotten anyone out of prison. Uh, in our work, we just we've guided some of their efforts and we've helped the parole board see them for who they really are. And the second thing is that the very low recidivism rate among our clients who've been released doesn't actually tell you very much about the person's quality of life. Uh, we think that some more useful metrics would include whether people are housed, whether they're employed, whether they're able to access the kind of social and emotional support they need after decades of incarceration. Um, fortunately, we, we our clients score pretty high on those measures too, but it, they're, they're even more important than the recidivism rates. Uh, I also used the term parole applicant <clears throat> earlier, but people don't actually have to apply for parole. It, they're automatically considered when they've served the minimum number of years uh, required by the sentences, uh, whether it's seven years or 15 years or 25 years of a life sentence. Uh, and what's even more is that the rules in California actually mandate that people must normally be released when they become eligible. Uh, unfortunately, in practice, only 16% of the scheduled parole hearings result in parole grants, 16%. Uh, in this series of discussions we're going to have, we're going to be discussing some of the, the problems that result from us spending in, here in California some $14 billion every year on this prison system that violates the law that requires people to be released. Um, this particular episode, really, we're gonna talk about um, 
we're, the whole series is going to be about trauma, race, and mass incarceration. But in this one, we're going to start to explore whether um, our society is really willing to to offer healing to those who are both survivors and perpetrators of violence. Um, and I'm I'm really honored to be joined by by Zachary Norris. Um, and our next episode, which will be on the 26th, we're going to talk with Nicole Porter from the Sentencing Project and with Emil De Weaver from Prison Renaissance, who's also a former client of ours. We're going to talk to them about how race may become a, a proxy for dangerousness in this discretionary parole process. Um, and then in the final episode, which will be on May 12th, we're gonna talk with uh, Danielle Sered from Common Justice and with Romerilyn Ralston from Project Rebound. And we're gonna discuss why decarceration efforts really have to include people convicted of violent crimes, even if they're serving life sentences. Uh, today, as I said, an honor to, to be starting with, with Zach. Um, and just to, to frame it a little bit, uh, I'll highlight that research shows us that up to 97% of people who are in prison have experienced one or more adverse childhood experiences. Um, and we know that people who experience four or more of these ACEs, as they're often referred to, four or more are up to seven times more likely to go to prison. Now, while we, we don't wanna pathologize a person's response to their trauma histories, we think it's important to explore the connection between trauma and incarceration. And it's important that we consider where we're going wrong as a society when we respond to violence or trauma with prison, which ultimately results in even more violence and trauma. So to, so to Zach, uh, I wanna sort of start off and, and ask what you would say are, are some, of, uh, some of the kind of community conditions or gaps in the social safety net that lead to such high incidence of these adverse childhood experiences? No, I really um, appreciate that question, Keith. And first of all, I have to say, like, I'm with Change Lawyers and Uncommon Law, so I'm already winning. Y'all are doing amazing work. I am just proud to be uh, a part of this conversation uh, and look forward to checking out future episodes as well, um, just given the amazing guests that you mentioned um, who are coming up after me. So just just really want to say thank you for having me. Um, you know, I think uh, a social safety net saying that we have one in the United States is uh, a stretch. Um, I think at one point there were investments made from social security to welfare to um, things uh, to, you know, even here in California, we had one of the best public school systems across the country. And that has been um, just eviscerated to use a, a, a word is it's been demolished. It's been trashed. It's it's the the, the social safety net is unfortunately in, in tatters. And so um, everything from healthcare to education to social services have suffered during the same time period that we embarked on the largest prison building boom in human history, right? And you mentioned 35,000 people in California serving life sentences. I mean, that number still astounds me and I do this work, you know? Um, we, every city across the country is spending um, the lion's share of its resources on policing. Um, we we see in California, we built 23 new prisons and just one new university from 1980 to now, something along those lines. Um, and if we're talking about the federal level, look, 53 cents of every federal dollar, discretionary dollar goes to the military. So we have this acculturated response to everyday ills that um, leads with punishment, leads with prisons, leads with um, law enforcement in ways that actually has not produced greater safety and has instead worsened cycles of poverty, violence, incarceration in black and brown communities that have been hurt first and worst. And 
So, you know, I talk about in the book, the, the story of um, Darrell Feaster and Alan Feaster. And I think, you know, some of Darrell and Alan's uh, experience really reflects the lack of support. Uh, Darrell was, you know, 14, getting, cutting school, getting involved in really minor stuff. Um, his dad, um, Alan, had served in the military, had had trauma related to that. As we know, many black and brown folks go into the military without a, a ton of other options. Um, and as a result of um, Darrell being in, involved in like cutting school and small stuff, he got sent to a, a group home across the state of California, was involved in the, the theft of a car, trying to get back home to Stockton, was sent to the California Youth Authority Youth Prison System, where he spent the greater part of 18 months on solitary confinement before it is believed that he and his cellmate committed suicide. His, his father never believed that. Um, but um, what, what was clear with Alan was that he was not going to let that tragedy stop him from speaking out. He really decided he was gonna adopt all of the young people inside of the California Youth Authority Youth Prison System, and then went on to push for and fight for changes in the closure of youth prisons and the redirection of resources away from you know, punishment first towards the rebuilding of a social safety net. You know, why couldn't Alan have gotten you know, a social worker in the home to support him as he was, you know, fighting desperately um, in a job, shining shoes as a, a ho at a hotel in San Francisco, traveling so many hours, not able to be there for his son in the way that he wanted to be. Why couldn't, you know, Darrell be given the kind of quality education that really engages folks? Um, why, you know, didn't Alan later in his life get the kind of quality health care he should have? Um, so those are the kinds of social safety net elements that I think we should be building up and unfortunately have drastic consequences in the lives of, of people across the country, black, white, brown, and, and, uh, just everybody across the spectrum. Yeah. Thank, thanks. Thanks for that, Zach. You know, we, we, uh, we, we know people of color are disproportionately represented in, in our prison populations. You know, there's, Obviously, the legacy, legacy of slavery and, and it's just the historic criminalization of black and brown folks. You know, what would it look like to have a system that that keeps people safe while also starting to repair this intergener intergenerational trauma uh, and harm that, that that cycles of poverty and racism have really wrought on communities of of color? What would that look like? Yeah, you know us. I start with the basic understanding that there is a long history of demonizing individuals, separating them from their families and communities. So, so many of the stereotypes from youth super predator to welfare queen really isolates individuals in ways that um, don't recognize their full humanity. Right. And that history of family separation obviously has a, a, a long trajectory inside of the United States, all the way back to slavery and the genocide of indigenous people. And I think that starts with a real recognition that that is part of our history and that that history has ramifications all the way up to the present and will continue to have ramifications in the future if we don't address it. So what does that look like? I think it looks like moving away from a framework of fear that isolates individuals from their families and demonizes them and begins to bring resources back to communities that have been most harmed by this huge prison building boom. And those resources should be in the form of books, not bars, jobs, not jails, healthcare and housing, not handcuffs. And I think one story to just kind of illustrate what that looks like is the story of Richmond, California, where, you know, at the turn of the century, early 2000s, Richmond had one of the highest per capita murder rates in the country. And the city council was up in arms about what to do. Um, Devon Bogan had worked in Oakland, came to Richmond and said, I want to create a mentorship program for the young men that the city has identified and police have identified 
that they believe are responsible for the homicides in the city of Richmond. And he said that this program would include a monthly <clears throat> stipend. It would include positive mentorship um, from formerly incarcerated folks and other trusted messengers in the community. And it would also include travel opportunities for these young men to be able to expand their horizons. And lastly, it would also engage them in the solutions of peace and building in the city of Richmond and violence prevention. And that program, though people were super skeptical, it got a lot of flack for them from the media over, you know, a near decade long period. Uh, they were successful in reducing homicides by, by some 70 percent, which is not just important for those young men, but also just important for the city of Richmond as a whole, because <laughs> mothers and grandmothers could then take their kids to the local park. You know, shopkeepers were keeping their their stores open longer. It had a huge positive benefit for the city of Richmond as a whole. And it really demonstrates like a few shifts that I think are necessary. We need to move from isolation um, to participation, right? Moving away from, um, you know, not valuing people's contribution. And what Devon really did was say, look, I want to ask you, um, y'all are the folks who have been regarded as the problem. What do you believe the solutions are? And really engage them in a process of peace building within the city of Richmond. He flip the script on this resource deprivation question that we've been talking about and put money in the pockets of these young men on a monthly basis so they could support themselves and their families, right? And, um, you know, that kind of shift from deprivation to resources is something that I also talk about broadly in the book. Um, and these are the kinds of, um, I think examples of what we can do right here, right now to begin to address a long history of intergenerational trauma and um, and really engaging folks in active in active peace building, right? In active peace building in communities across the country. Thanks, you know, I, I in what you're describing in, in, in Richmond, it, it makes me think about how there becomes this 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 barrier in our in our thinking and our imagination when when we raise the the prospect of violence, right? How, how can we how can we um, transform our relationship to violence and the people who 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 engage in violence and and you know in our work a lot of um, a lot of our challenge is in helping people see that the person who committed an act that we label as violent is not fundamentally different from someone who, who committed an act we may label as nonviolent or or you know caused by drugs um there's this, that that false dichotomy many of us has, have talked about it yeah. recently but but um but i don't think people understand that that if we really are serious about eliminating mass incarceration for example uh, in california we're not going to get there if you don't address um, our responses to violence. And we have in our prison population, about 76% of folks are there for serious and violent crimes. So if you think you're, if you're gonna cut it in half, you can't right. get there. Right. Math doesn't work out, right? And so right. Uh, what are your thoughts about how we encourage, force, you know, help people see past those labels and see the individuals in the communities that are directly uh, impacted and transform the relationship to our, our you know, carceral response to violence. Yeah. No, I really appreciate that question. I think the first part of it is, you know, uh, I want to just echo what you said that like violence as, as Danielle Sered, who you'll have on with common justice is talking about like violence doesn't start from nowhere. Right. Um, uh, violence starts with poverty. It starts with other forms of violence. It, 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 originates um, in a context. And I think if we actually acknowledge what that context is and begin to reshape that context, we will uh, effectively address violence. And so I think understanding that it is a public health issue in the same way that drug use and abuse and mental health and school discipline are, um, 
are public health issues that can be dealt with through public health approaches. And that's on a kind of broad level. I think the other piece is like the, the thing you, you named around imagination is so important. Um, two things, one, like we didn't have prisons as uh, our go-to response over the course of human history, right? People figured out, people were violent toward one another and in many communities, they used restorative uh, approaches uh, to address violence and harm. And so it is not only possible, but it has been done um, and has been effective. And there are modern day examples of the effectiveness of a restorative justice approach, in particular to violence. Um, a lot of people, when I talk about restorative justice, which is this concept of like the person who's caused harm, the person who's been harmed, sitting in a circle surrounded by the people that care about them, an accountability plan is developed, then that person who's caused harm has to follow through with that accountability plan. And I'll tell people that restorative justice works, lowers recidivism rates, victims report much higher satisfaction rates with the process. And I'll go through the whole spiel and at the end, people will be like, okay, but what about violence? Right. right. And the research actually shows that restorative justice works even better in the context of violence. Right. Because restorative justice is a process whereby the person who's been harmed sits next to the person that's harmed them and doesn't work in all cases. But where there's voluntary participation, participation on both sides, um, they the the stats really speak for themselves and including and even especially in cases of violence it works well because um th there's almost like a more identifiable victim right and so the the aha moment the sort of recognition of of what's happened in that instance and the harm that that person has caused is is readily apparent but then even in addition to that, what restorative justice does, it brings those circles of support into the conversation, right? And so then we're able to start having those conversations around adverse childhood experiences, around the trauma that that person who's caused harm has also themselves experienced that may have contributed to, to, to the current act that we're talking about, right? And so it's not just about kind of accountability between those two people, but it then, also becomes this broader accountability conversation around what could we as a community have done to stop this from happening. And then that begins really the community building process that needs to happen, which is the essence, I believe, of real safety, right? When we build community, it becomes much more possible to hold people accountable when they have caused harm, but also we're creating the conditions that lessen the likelihood of future harms happening. So I guess I would say like, A, let's, you know, just understand that violence is a public health issue. We can deal with it in a public health fashion. And B, let's really lift up those examples of, of restorative justice and transformative justice working so that it's popularized and people can see past the just, um, you know, prison bars and guards as being the sort of foundation of, of what safety is. Yeah, you know, when, when you when you talk about that, I, I, I go back to um, the, the frequent occurrence in parole hearings where you have um, someone who has caused harm and, and is serving a life sentence, obviously, appearing before the parole board after 15, 20, 30, sometimes 40 years, and you have um, in some cases, it's only about 10% of, of parole hearings, but you have representatives from the family uh, of, the, of, of the victim um, are showing up at the hearing. And too often, what they are sharing with the parole board is, um, you know, pain that is, that is just as raw as it was decades earlier. You know, there's, there's no, there's no, resolution, there's no healing. Um, and and the process, our discretionary parole process is not built for it. So we, we shouldn't pretend otherwise. But I come out of those those hearings just thinking how, uh, regardless of the outcome, that it's not good for anybody. 
Yeah. Like it doesn't actually serve anyone, it, whether the person comes out with a parole grant or they're denied parole. Um, it hurts all of us, everybody in that room, and reliving the trauma by both the person who caused the harm and, and the family members that, that experienced it like this. Yeah. Um, and and I just there has to be something something different. Um, but I guess when you think about the the values that really that we, that we see throughout our current um, criminal legal system, uh, it, those values look like punishment. They look like retribution, uh, cruelty. Um, white supremacy, yeah. you know, responsibility over accountability. These these are some of the values that clearly show up in how we we carry out, um, you know, the, the, the process. And I guess as we're thinking of what a future system might look like, um, and if we were if we we're going to have a future system that's informed by the value of healing, yeah, um, is it realistic for us to imagine a world in which you know our society is offering a, a healing? To, to people who are both survivors and perpetrators of violence? Maybe that's a rhetorical question, but if you have some-, some No, some I think it's absolutely possible and necessary because, you know, uh, again, lifting up the work at Common Justice, they work with folks in, in Brooklyn and other parts of New York who are both survivors of, of crime and folks who have committed crime. And, uh, that is actually typical. It's not atypical. We, you know, we did research um, that resulted in a report called Who Pays the True Cost of Incarceration on Families? And we asked folks who had loved ones who are incarcerated, have you been a, a victim of crime? And half of folks reported that they have. And we know that people underreport um, some of those statistics. And so it, we, we create these false dichotomies, right, between um, perpetrator and 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 victim, and they really are just that false um, false distinctions. Uh, we've, you know, all experienced harm in our life. We've all caused harm in our life, um, and I think the reality is that none of us would want to be judged by the worst thing that we've ever done as as being the sole way of understanding who we are. And we have a, a criminal court system that absolutely does that and does that, um, as you named in terms of the pro process, but also in the court process that uses too often race as a proxy for harm, as a, as a proxy for dangerousness. Um, and so some of the work we have to do is to begin and to continue to challenge um, white supremacy in all of its forms and to uh, but also then to address this cultural piece that you're naming, that um, we have to think about ways that we can popularize, um, not just in terms of the law, but I think also culturally, we are a nation that was founded in this history of genocide and slavery, um, founded in um, a, a history that must be named and addressed. And we can do that not just through, you know, boring documentaries or, or around that history, but also let's think about in our popular culture ways that we can be lifting up stories of redemption, of restorative justice. And and that's the part of that's the cultural shift that I think was will, will be necessary. Yeah, thanks. And, and you know, something you 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 touched on and, and I know that. Um, Danielle talks about it in her book, you talk about it in your book, and, and I've seen it um, with, you know, many of the people I work with, and that is um, so many people who have been engaged in, in perpetrating violence, harm to other people, um, didn't even know that they were survivors of violence themselves. Mm -hmm. Like, didn't even think, oh, that stuff I experienced, I was actually victimized, I was harmed in some way. Um, and once you realize that, it, it sort of raises questions. Well, what does that make me? Am I only that? Or is, is, yeah. is there some, some part of me that's not connected to that? And, and how do I overcome that? Um, but I want, I want to, I want to shift, shift gears. And this, this may be my last question. We'll see, we'll see how it goes before right, we yeah. open it to the audience. But I, I want to bring it local a little bit because I was, um, I thought of you on the weekend, on Sunday in particular, I'm, I'm, Coming from uh, coming down down uh, 
grand and in, in here in Oakland and I happened upon Lake Merritt and I saw a sea of black people mm. and I heard drums, I heard music. I, I said, I, I said, you know, Lake Merritt is back. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's back. <laughs> you know, because when I first moved to the Bay Area in the mid nineties, Lake Merritt mm. on the Sundays and, and other, you know, sort of, it was like the place to be a lot going on. And you, you talk yeah. about this in your book and how, yeah. how that changed. Um, and, and I was thinking like, this is, this is beautiful to see. And I said, the question I need to ask Zach when I talked to him this week is, um, A, is it really, is it really here? Is this really true? Yeah. And how do we keep it? Like how, yeah. how do, how do we maintain this as a place for black and brown people? Or is it too late? Is that, is yeah. that opportunity gone in Oakland? I know you no. talk about some books. It's, so, definitely, so. it's definitely not yeah. too late. Uh, it de we are doing this work y'all. Uh, in partnership with y'all and so many others, because we believe it's not too late. Um, we are, are, you know, located in East Oakland, have been fighting. Uh, and um, first of all, I just want to say, like, actually, thank you for reading the book. Uh, I appreciate that, too. <laughs> um, I do talk a little bit about the, um, the lake. Uh, in the mid 90s, I was a teenager um, and I used to go every summer to the festival at the lake until they shut it down, right? And it was a, a space where Black folk were out in numbers. It felt like, you know, I don't know if folks have seen the the video for uh, Will Smith's Summertime, which also came out in the, the, the mid nineties. I felt like I was in a Will Smith video. Um, it was, you know, just this beautiful expression of community, right? And and your question about like, well, how long will it last is not, is, a, is an informed question, right? Because every time it feels like Black folks have built community in this country, it has been destroyed so quickly, whether that be through a freeway or through uh, a so-called race, race riot, um, or whether it be through, you know, legal actions to stop cruising around the lake that, that really shut down you know people coming together um and i do think that um we can uh collectively fight for uh spaces where people can be their full selves whether that be as a black person whether that be as a gender queer person whoever you are that we should all be able to be out and, and be building community one of the things that I think people can do to support that kind of beloved inclusive community is by participating in Night Out for Safety and Liberation. We do this every year, the first Tuesday in August, and we organize around it year round because what we've seen, you know, we know Barbecue Becky, the, that meme started here in Oakland where Black folks were getting called at the lake for just, you know, eating and being around each other. And, and so like that is uh, a reality that I think we, we must name. And part of what we're doing with Night Out for Safety and Liberation is trying to be, build a community where we don't just watch each other, but we see each other and we recognize each other's humanity. And based on that, we, we build safety. And one of the things that we also do be a night out for safety and liberation is encourage people to connect their city council members to connect um, and push police departments to connect uh, to push city policy to be redirecting resources in the ways that we've described are necessary towards public health solutions to public health issues and towards stopping doing this dumb stuff like criminalizing people for just being people for walking for you know hanging out at the lake and for doing things that all of us do as as a as you know being human beings and, and relating to one another so i hope that kind of answers the, the question it does you know and, and i'm, I'm going to ask one more and then we'll open up to the audience q a and, and that is about you know, when, when, I, when i read your book it was called we keep us safe yeah and then i said man this is a then then you know a year later i'm saying well this is an even sharper name yeah. about defunding fear uh, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your 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 thinking about that and and whether that's that's a response to 
uh, defund the police yeah. and calls yeah. to, as you were just saying, sort of re actually redistribute the funds to the real community-based solutions that we know are more, more effective. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it is absolutely a response and a support for the call to defund police and prisons. I think, look, you know, we live in a country where we have the most people per capita incarcerated. Um, and, and just the resources need to be redirected. When I talk with families of young people who have their kids inside the juvenile justice system right here in Alameda County, and they'll talk about, you know, here's this apprenticeship program that my child is being engaged because he's involved with the juvenile justice system. Um, or, you know, I got a gift card from Target to support me getting some groceries. And they'll say, all of these things are welcome, you know, but why did my child have to be involved in the criminal justice system to get these kinds of support? Yeah. And what a difference it would have made, you know, five years ago, six years ago to have this kind of care and attention that I'm getting. And obviously we know that many people in the adult prison system are not getting care and attention. And I'm not to, that's not to say that even the juvenile justice system is, is uniform in terms of providing some of these kind of conduits, conduits to opportunity. Yeah. But certainly, you know, I think that there's an absolute need to just redirect resources um, in a way. And I, and I want it to be just clear about that in a way that was provocative so people could say, you know, I agree with this or I don't agree with this, but I know that there's going to be some content contained in this book that I'm going to grapple with. Yeah, got it, got it. Uh, so Carlos, are we ready to uh, entertain some audience questions? We are, and uh, we've had a very active uh, comment section while you all were talking, mostly in response to what you all were saying. Um, so let's just start from the beginning. So someone brought up, and this is this was news to me. Uh, do you all have thoughts on the proposed guaranteed income for East Oakland that's been um, talked about by the mayor's office here? And how does that sort of relate to um, everything that you all were talking about right now? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going to defer to Zach on this. I, I've I've seen a little bit about it, but I I, I assume you've probably thought more about it than I have. I mean, we we've heard stories of where it can be. Effective. There seemed to be a good report out of Stockton. Yeah. Uh, we don't know if Oakland, this model is similar, better, worse. Zach, you have thoughts on it? Yeah, I don't have thoughts about the particular model in Oakland because I haven't looked at it as closely as I would like to. Um, I, that being said, I think a you know some level of guaranteed income is necessary. Is uh, is something that as far back as Dr. King and probably before that, folks have called for. I think it should be done in conjunction with the uh, actual build out of the social safety net, as opposed to people thinking about it as an either or. Yeah. Um, we should have universal health care and we should have guaranteed income and those things don't have to be, uh, should, be combat should be compatible. Um, that's my, my general thought. I also think that, you know, tying some of these resources to an explicit reparative frame to address the harms that have uh, disproportionately impacted black and brown people, people of color um, is important and necessary and is something that other cities are starting to take steps towards. And I think insofar as Oakland um, does that, then it, uh, we should support. Um, we should support those efforts. All right, thank you. Um, one question that just came up as you were talking, Zach, is um, how can abolitionists and you know the activist folks, how can we respond to calls for justice, aka you know prison, um, from police officers and people in law enforcement? Um, you know, some of us don't believe that prison equals accountability, but other folks do. So what is sort of like, um, especially for folks who are new to activism in the room, what's their response to that? Yeah, I really appreciate that. Like, first I would say like, none of the shifts that I've been talking about are overnight shifts, right? These are things that take years and, and, and decades to really undo years and decades and centuries of harm. 
Um, so I think when we start with that, you know, one helpful analogy that I've heard is, you know, the analogy of climate change, where we've made a decision that fossil fuels are a strategy of energy production that actually produces more harm than we're comfortable with. And, um, and we need to shift away from fossil fuels. And I think the same can be said of kind of prisons uh, as a, a core strategy of uh, public safety, that more often than not, they're doing more harm than good. And that doesn't mean that we can just all of a sudden shift um, in the same way we can't just shift overnight away from fossil fuels. Um, and, and so I think the, the calls for accountability around police violence are very much real um, and very much necessary. But what we've seen in the past is that accountability for a particular officer doesn't actually produce the change that we want to see. That isn't to say that there shouldn't be direct accountability, but I think we should be skeptical, skeptical about um, relying on putting someone in a cage as 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 bringing the kind of change that we want to seek. And so one of the things that I name in the book that I think is a better example of a kind of broader shift is some of the work that folks have done in Chicago around one, around the police department um, and, um, and, and accountability for folks who have been tortured inside of the uh, Chicago police department. Um, obviously Chicago's police department, as we've seen just this week's, uh, still, uh, sorry, um, still has a, a, a lot of challenges. But that being said, um, there was a reparations campaign where activists won some level of education around the torture that was happening inside of Chicago police departments, the inclusion of that um, history inside of the public school system in the form of curriculum, as well as uh, reparations for some of the victims of police torture. Um, and I think those kind of more broader solutions, holistic forms of accountability are necessary because we aren't just talking about the accountability of Derek Chauvin, we're talking about the accountability of the uh, police department as a whole, of the city as a whole and the state. So yes let's let's look for individual accountability but especially when those people are representatives of the state that accountability has to go broader than that just individual yeah. well speaking of that we're actually getting quite a few questions about sort of like the system <laughs> um so courts DA's offices how how do we hold those folks accountable and is there a way that us as community members can participate in that accountability? You know, I, I have some limited thoughts about that. This, this is actually, I was uh, in a conversation related to this um, just last week where um, some folks were, were recounting how one particular uh, DA was um, acknowledging that in his career, that he and his office um, had harmed people by their policies and practices of um, of seeking, you know, the 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 longest, you know, harshest sentences for for you know crimes that they were prosecuting, and uh, recognized that they needed to change. And then, fast forward, we see the same person um, kind of bragging or at least at least patting his office on the back for having secured a conviction uh, and prison time for really minor offense um and and when i think about the sort of the the politics around it that we if we have people who who are more afraid of losing their their position in office then they are motivated to do the right thing, then we've got a big problem, a fundamental problem. And, and, and when we have um, voters and others in the community not willing to hold that person accountable to the community for who they said they would be, right? You, you said you would be different. 
And if you're not, we have to let you go. And you have to understand that as a consequence. I, I think we haven't been willing to do that. And some of that's fueled by all the all the fear mongering that 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 we see whenever there's sort of a you know a sensationalized case or a bad outcome, and oh, that's going to make you look bad. Let me let me go back to our the the tried and true you know tough on crime position that will keep me in office, but it'll also perpetuate the same problems and harms that we've been seeing for for, for decades. So I think real accountability has been missing at the level of um, even so-called progressive prosecutors. Um, and, and what's really sad to see is that that these recall efforts are ways to playing on those same old, you know, that old fear-mongering tactics to override the will of what people in the community actually want from, the, from their DAs. Zach, maybe you have some other thoughts about that. No, I agree with that 100%. I mean, it's a political problem. And it's a political problem that's made worse by that the dynamic that we've talked about, which is like so many state resources have gone towards policing and prisons. And then those associations become more and more powerful as it relates to the kind of government infrastructure, right? And so we have to, as everyday people, as neighbors and communities really speak out for something different because the culture has, has been dominated by special interest groups that want to maintain a status quo um, that has been harmful for black and brown communities. And I would say all communities, even, you know, rates of police violence um, and the levels at which white people are killed by the police are actually higher also than um, similarly situated countries around the world. So this is a problem that I think, um, you know, people need to engage, need to pay attention to who's the sheriff, who's the DA, who's the judge, and really get behind the scenes on some of those questions as we vote and as we organize and as we hold those folks accountable. Uh, Zach, it's almost as if you just predicted uh, the next question that just came in, which is actually about uh, sheriffs. So um, can you all comment specifically here in Alameda County on, um, the efforts right now undergoing um, to get Sheriff Ain Hearn, which is who's the sheriff of Alameda County, um, to out of office, um, the folks running against him and why it's so difficult um, to get folks like a sheriff out of office. Yeah, I mean, speaking in my personal capacity, um, not in my uh, Ella Baker Center capacity, I will say that um, we absolutely need a new sheriff in Alameda County. Um, this is a sheriff who is kind of like the Bull Connor of the Bay Area, the Joe Arpaio of the Bay Area, someone whose office has retweeted the alt-right, who hosted the Oath Keepers, which is an alt-right formation um, at, at some of his big weapons kind of expo paramilitary uh, conferences that they used to do um, and who has been responsible for literally dozens of deaths. And, you know, the sheriff in Alameda County is also the coroner. So it creates a conflict of interest where if there's a death inside the jail, then the, or not a conflict of interest, but it basically the, the sheriff is also responsible for naming the cause of death. So it it, it creates an, a, an opportunity for um, obf obfuscating like what, what really happened. And so I think that we absolutely, you know, need to get organized and engaged and um, push for a, a different vision um, because the sheriff holds so much power as it relates to immigration policy and jails and um, I'll stop there because I, I could go on for a minute. <laughs> yeah, and I don't really have much to add because, uh, you know, I think Zach put a nice, nice uh, uh, touch on. I agree. Um, someone wants to know about the restorative justice models effectiveness within the criminal injustice system, or would it be better worth our efforts to move restorative justice outside of that system and not work within mm. the system. Mm. You know, I, I'll, I'll offer just some observations about what I see in prison. And that, that's where more of my 
focus is uh, as opposed to, to local criminal justice efforts. And most of my clients have been convicted of, of murder. And with very few exceptions, they report that the, the most profound experiences and, and life-changing transformative experiences they've had in prison came when they're involved in some type of restorative justice practice. And, and specifically when they're involved in a dialogue with either a, a, a victim survivor of their crime or a surrogate, uh, or they've even witnessed those, those conversations where there's an opportunity for he healing on both sides. Um, often people re report that it's the first time, even after decades in prison, that they have had to or had the opportunity to come face to face with someone directly impacted by their actions. And, and it's a profound experience because it, it instantly creates that empathy that we, we often associate as, as, as lacking in, in their lives, but we have a system that doesn't provide those connections, those opportunities by design or by default, it doesn't matter, it's not there. Uh, but where, where I see it showing up inside prisons is, is it consistently has a really dramatic positive impact on the lives of those who've caused serious harm and you know, harm, kind of unspeakable harm sometimes can be transformed in those moments. So I, so I know what's possible after the most extreme violence. Um, so that, that gives me a lot of hope for what's possible on a, on a misdemeanor level or even a uh, you know, just a community-based um, level. Yeah, and for my part, I'd say that um, we believe in and support, um, you know, restorative justice practices that do engage the system and that, and in ones that don't. Um, ultimately, you know, I think the criminal court system does create an adversarial framework that doesn't recognize the way in which all of us have been harmed and caused harm. Um, and, and ultimately, I do believe that we should have a different um, form of justice. Um, but, you know, again, this is not overnight change. Um, we support um, both formal and informal approaches to restorative justice for that reason. We created a, a new building called Restore Oakland that has a dedicated space for restorative justice. And um, it we're working with Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth, Community Works, and others who have um, engaged in formal restorative justice processes. So the DA refers someone to a program they go through a restorative process. If they go through it um, and complete it, they may have nothing show up on their record at all. Um, and also we created the space also for people who don't want to involve law enforcement, who um, are don't feel safe in, in calling the police um, for whatever reason and want to use the space to, to hold people accountable while still holding them in community. And um, I think the key uh, in both aspects are accountability, right? Like, you know, in the informal context, making sure that the person who's caused harm, there's a community that's supporting that restorative justice process that can help hold that individual accountable. In the formal side, I think a different form of accountability is needed in addition to accountability around the harm that's happened inside the restorative that's being addressed by the restorative justice circle. And that is the accountability for elected officials, right? Because those elected officials are determining um, which kinds of cases uh, get referred to restorative justice. And, you know, in Alameda County, for example, a lot of the cases that have been referred to restorative justice tend to be um, less serious cases, even as right across the water in San Francisco, they're referring um, some more serious cases for restorative justice and having really positive impact. Um, and so th the key to me is not whether or not it's sort of formal or informal, but, but whether we're taking the approach of looking at accountability holistically and ensuring that as a community, we're fighting for accountability, not just within the 
the particular case, but really accountabil accountability as a whole. Thank you for that, both of you. Um, and we're, we're just at the end of time. I want to make a quick plug for part two of this series, which, um, you know, everything you all were talking about, we could talk about this for so much more. And that's what part two is about. And that's going to focus on the parole process and sort of the, the havoc that that process uh, wrecks on communities of color um, and how it's so discretionary and very secretive. Um, so Keith, I'll, um, I'll leave you with the last word um, to send us off. Well, I just, you know, thanks again to Zach and I really appreciate your contribution to this, to this, this conversation. We know it's just a little bit that we can get into uh, in this hour. There's a whole lot more to say. Uh, and, you know, I look forward to continuing these, these conversations. I also, you know, I think about how, um, how we're, we're trying to tackle these huge questions and issues, you know, in an hour long segment, it's not possible to do, but if, if we can at least start and spark the conversations that can continue outside of these spaces and make connections that we can build on, then something else is possible. So I appreciate your contribution, Zach, and look forward to what we get to build together. Right on. Thank you. Take care. I'll take care. Thanks.